Well, welcome to the third in our series of Bible studies looking at Luke's Gospel. Um, thank you for joining me uh, today. If you've got a Bible, uh, please do turn to Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verses 26 to 38 in Luke 1. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So we're going to consider these verses uh, together. And uh, first of all, I wonder if you've ever listened to a song and misheard the lyrics. There are some famously misheard song lyrics with some famous songs. So Abba's song, Dancing Queen. People here feel the beat from not the tambourine, but the tangerine. And the Beatles, I want to hold your hand. Uh, some people hear that as I want to hold your ham, as in meat. Or perhaps Oasis, you're going to be the one that saves me. But what people hear is you're going to be the one who takes me to Sainsbury's. Well, we can easily mishear the words of this particular passage in Luke's Gospel, and they've mis been misheard quite a lot over the years because a mistake was made in about AD 400. Jerome, um, working in a Latin translation, um, translated um, famously Mary's um, response, um, which became the Ave Maria or the Hail Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace. Well, unfortunately, uh, that is a very bad translation of the original. It's not Hail Mary, full of grace, as we're going to see. So there's one mistake there. And there's another way we can mishear this passage by thinking, well, this is all about Mary. And often at Christmas time, the focus is very much upon Mary. Well, actually, we have to take our focus off Mary and actually look to God because God's word, the Bible, is God, if you like, preaching God at us. And one of the most important things we can do when looking at any uh, passage to study is ask, what is God doing here? Or what can we understand or know about God from this passage? So that's going to be our approach, is to look at what is God saying about God in this particular passage of Scripture. So Luke chapter one, I um, want to make two points here from this passage. First of all, about God's grace. What does it actually mean? And then to see the main point of the passage is actually about the word of God, God's word. So first of all, verse 30, which is the famously um, mistranslated verse. Um, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God. Um, Hail Mary, full of grace. Well, it's not that Mary was full of grace as it was if she could dispense grace to others she was so full of grace is what some people teach is that she can actually give others grace it was actually that grace was upon her god's grace was upon mary it's not that she was sort of full of grace on the inside it's as if she was covered in god's grace on the outside she'd found favor with god this expression to find favor is the expression of god's grace in the scriptures to find favor so you'll read in the Old Testament, certain people, for example, Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. It means Noah found grace, or if you like, better way to describe it actually is grace found Noah. And in this passage, if you like, grace finds Mary. What did Mary do to deserve to be the mother of Jesus? Well, nothing. It was grace. 
and grace is uh, a free gift of God, God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, grace is a free gift from God and it is irrespective of merit or deserving. And the centre of the story here is not actually Mary, although she receives the grace, she's given promises. And it's the word of God that's actually the centre of the passage here, because even Mary herself says, verse 37, no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. It's interesting, isn't it? To go back to, if you go back to the very beginning of Luke uh, and chapter one, remember what was said uh, back right at the beginning in our very first study together, that the word of God does the work of God. So if you look at the very first few verses of Luke, then you'll see um, what Luke says to us about the word doing the work. Verse two, the word was handed down to us by those who were the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Well, what is Mary in this passage? But a great example of being a servant of the word. And that's what she says, verse 38, hey, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. She recognises that she's a servant to God and it is God's word that does the work. She's been given God's word. She's been given a promise that she's going to have this child who'll be called the son of the most high. So it's going to be God's son is going to be born to her. And she recognises that this word is being fulfilled. Well, what word? Well, if you look at verse 32, the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, this is the word being fulfilled here. It's a fulfillment of a promise in the Old Testament. Now, it's not often read this one at Christmas, but if you um, flick back to 2 Samuel and chapter 7 in your Old Testament, God makes promises to King David. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And if you have a look halfway through verse 11, I'll just start reading. The Lord declares to you that, David, the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I'll raise up for you offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and then establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house in my name and then establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. Now, there's a promise, obviously, for David that his son Solomon is going to inherit the throne. But this is a kingdom that will be established forever. This is going to be an eternal kingdom that a descendant of David will eternally reign on the throne. And now this is being fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is David's eternal son who will sit on the throne of David and will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. Back to Luke chapter one, verse 33. His kingdom will never end. So this is an Old Testament promise made probably a thousand years before that is now being fulfilled in Jesus. And so Mary recognises that it's God's work here that's doing the work. It's these promises that are being fulfilled. And she is simply a servant of God and a servant of the word. So I hope you can see the centre of the passage here is not actually Mary. It's actually the word of God that's doing the work of God. And Mary recognises that she's simply a servant. So what does this mean for us? Well, we too are servants of the word. It's the word of God that does the work of God in our lives. How are we going to see transformation in our own lives, in the church's life, in our town's life? Through the word of God, doing the work of God. It's the word that does the work. The word may work. Through us, we may be the servants through which the word works, but it's not actually us that do the hard work. It's the word that does the work. So the more we can sow the word into our own lives, into our church and into our community, the more the work of God we shall expect to see.